Alright, testing. Can everyone hear me? Uh, well, just give me a moment here while I get set up. Sorry for the delay, guys. Um, I got logged out of our X-Trades Twitch account and uh, had to figure out some workarounds in order to get back in. Uh, so it was a bit last minute fiddling around with settings here. Uh, also, I am streaming from my personal account onto X-Trades using a key. Um, I didn't re even realize you could do that, but that's what I'm doing, trying to set up now and get everything back into order. Uh, so we're not going to have chat show up on the screen or anything, uh, or any, any of the other fancy settings. <laughs> but just give me a moment here and, and we'll get started in a couple minutes. Thanks for your patience, guys. All right, I'm ready to get started. Let me check on the chat real quick here. <laughs> Where's the FUD at? Uh, no FUD today. I think we passed the stimulus bill. Um, I'll probably have to get passed back to the House since I think the Senate did some modifications or revisions to the bill, the stimulus bill. Uh, but it looks like it's, you know, I'm pretty sure it's going to pass regardless. I mean, Congress is basically democrat run right now uh, they have the majority so um they should be able to pass anything with relative ease right it's just going to be a matter of time um who is this whu <laughs> uh you should archive couldn't find your first one so our first seminar was on the er calendar spreads uh so twitch actually removes our archive after two weeks uh, I think that's just related to our status as a Twitch. I think we're a Twitch partner now, so we're slowly making our ways up the ranks for Twitch streaming. Uh, but our videos are only archived for two weeks, and I happen to only do the seminars every two weeks. So basically, if you want to watch, you have to watch before I start broadcasting the next one. Um, they will be... I do plan on like uploading them eventually, but I, I just haven't had time to edit them and modify them to upload them to YouTube. Um, and YouTube has like a limit or a cap on the size and length as well. And the first video was three hours. Uh, so I, I just haven't had time to, to go through it and like edit it yet. Uh, I, I also think that another option would be that I would, um, I could possibly just redo the webinars. Uh, and I, I think that's, there's an advantage to that since it's live, uh, you guys can ask questions during it and I can answer those as we go. Um, and also the first seminar was a little bit of a, a mess as well. So I think it will get better uh, as I quote unquote redo it, right? So that's what I'm thinking about for that. But I will, um, I do plan on, on getting them up to YouTube once I get a chance to like edit and cut down those video sizes. Okay. Yes, uh, so this is Timehawk. 
Normally, it's 007 who's on here on the weekdays, and he does the ERs uh, after hours. So he goes over to ERs and he does chart requests. Uh, and then I do the seminars on here on the weekends. Oh, awesome. Uh, thanks for the, <laughs> the offer for the editing. Uh, I'll, I'll check up on that in a bit. Now, actually, um, Prophet, the last seminar was also by me, but I know JTW helped out a lot in the chat. <laughs> All right, so uh, I'm going to get started here. Now that I'm all caught up with you guys in chat. Uh, I'll do my best to keep up with the chat, but, you know, we do got a few folks in the chat to help out who are quite knowledgeable. So we, I know we got JTW here. Uh, 007 is probably here as well. And then we have a, our moderator team as well. So thanks to, to you guys, uh, Young Bull, Red Black. Um, I think there's probably a few others in here as well. But let's get started with today's seminar. Uh, today's seminar is going to be on vertical spreads. Uh, and originally I was going to do credit and debit spreads, like all of it, which is, you know, what vertical spreads are. Uh, but, you know, as I was doing it, I realized that if I wanted to cover everything in detail, it was probably going to take more than <laughs> two hours, right? So I, I, I'm going to talk about everything today. I'm going to talk about both credit and debit spreads, but I'll be mostly be focusing on debit spreads. And then on a future session, I'll go more into detail on uh, credit spreads. But I will still go over, you know, both of them today and as well as the pros and cons of each. Uh, so, yep, well, let's get started here. Oh, you just started following my alerts on uh, and I started moving into spreads. Well, hopefully, uh, you know, this these sessions can help you learn more about the spreads. Um, personally, I think spreads are, are, are the way to go for playing options. Uh, there, there's definitely advantages to playing just, you know, straight up calls and puts, but spreads offer you a lot more flexibility, right? So, um, that's the purpose of, of these courses is to explain why we even have these advanced strategies and the advantages of them, right? Uh, there are of course times where you, are going to want to just play straight up calls and puts. Um, but, you know, having the strategies basically in, in your arsenal um, is going to easily give you more profitable trades over time because you're going to be able to use different strategies depending on the market conditions, right? Um, okay. Anyways, introduction Who am I? I'm Time Hawk. I am a top analyst with Xtrade, which is our uh, trading community. Uh, we run off of Discord right now, but we do have plans for a website. Uh, the website is actually already created and it is in beta. I think quite a few of our members have access to it. Uh, we also have our own mobile app where we push out alerts and notifications on uh, the markets, uh, on tickers to trade, etc. cetera. Um, but our website is looking real sleek right now. It's, it's an amazing website um, and it's a great place to be able to share trade ideas. Uh, vote for people that you, you think are good. And uh, I just think that, you know, um, if you need anybody to talk to about trading or learn more about trading or to just bounce ideas off of uh, or learn the tricks of the trade, you know, come and join us at X Trades. Um, the link is on here. Uh, I was going to paste it into the chat, but I actually don't have access to the chat since I'm streaming from my personal account right now. Um, but I know that the bot, oh, there, there it is. So the bot puts it in there. So <laughs> come and join us. Um, but I've been training for seven years and I've been with X-Trace for about four and a half to five years now. Uh, probably even six years. Cause, uh, I, I just saw that <laughs> I got a change in my, one of my, um, what do you call those roles in, in discord? And it says uh, Enhanced Investor OG 2015. So it's been about six years now. Uh, but I focus primarily on swing trading. And I do scalp and day trade, but that's only when I watch the charts. So what is this course for? 
We're going to teach you everything about options from basics to advanced strategies. Uh, for today's particular lesson, you know, we're going to be focusing on spreads, which I think are, are sorry, vertical spreads, which I think are more of the basic, uh, one of the more basic strategies you can use in options. Um, but nevertheless, it is a powerful tool in order to give you better flexibility and risk management of your trading portfolio. Oh, and uh, that Bulbasaur is is my profile icon on Discord. So if you see that, that's me. Um, table of contents for today. I'm just going to do a quick recap of the previous seminar, which was on our income strategy series on covered calls. Uh, just to recap like what I did last time and, and see how those plays turned out. Just so you can see, you know, what are the pros and cons of those plays. Um, and so that's kind of what I plan on doing with every seminar. I'll always try to use real examples of things I did that week, and then I'll follow up on them on the next seminar so you can actually see what happens with those strategies, right? Uh, of course, feel free to definitely feel free to try them out on your own and, you know, paper trade them if you don't feel comfortable with it yet. Um, but, you know, all, all of these things are, are for, uh, you know, your educational purposes just to enhance your trading, right? Uh, after that, we're going to go over vertical spreads um or what are they and then we'll go over and break them down into credit and debit spreads which are the two different types of vertical spreads and then lastly we'll go over broker management how your brokerage is going to manage your spreads because when you come up to expiration date on your options or even before expiration date when you have a spread it means that you're selling an option right and if you're just buying an option that means you're buying the right to do something, right? So for calls, you're buying the right to buy um, the stock or the underlying asset at the strike price that you, you bought, right, for that call. So for example, if you got uh, Apple 150C for, I don't know, 319, March 19th, that means that you have the right to buy Apple at $150 per share, 100 shares of that, by... March 19th. Of course, you're not going to exercise that. And that's what exercising means is, is you're going to use that, um, your right to exercise option contract to buy those uh, shares, right? But this will never, you won't do this unless Apple is over $150, right? Because why would you pay $150 per share when Apple is at, say, $120 per share? Doesn't make sense, right? So uh, normally when you're just buying calls or buying puts and with puts you're just buying the right to sell at a certain price right you're not going to exercise those calls unless they are in the money right but if they're out of the money they won't be exercised and saying that if you're on the other side of the trade meaning if you're in a spread or you're naked put selling or whatever then that means that the person on the other end of the trade can exercise that contract if it is in the money if it's out of the money, they're not going to exercise it, right? But if they're in the money, they will exercise it, especially when it's close to expiration. And that's what we call assignment. So then you have the obligation to deliver 100 shares or times however many contracts you have of the asset at the price um, for that strike. So for example, if I instead sold Apple uh, 120C 319 and on March 19th, Apple was at $125. And let's say that I don't have any shares, right? I don't own any shares of Apple. That means I am going to be eating a $500 loss, right? Because I have to buy Apple at 125 and then I have to sell it to the person who exercised those strikes at 120. So uh, that's what assignment is. There is that risk when you sell options. With spreads, that risk is minimized, but I'll go more over that in detail at the very end uh, after we cover all, all the other details of the spreads today. Um, and then finally, at the very, very end, uh, after we go over all the material for today, I will have a question and answer session. I can take some chart requests or uh, you know talk about anything you guys want to learn about. So uh, I left some of the definitions in here. This is just from the previous lessons, um, you know, just so you don't have a basic understanding of options. I'm going to assume that you have some basic understanding of options already. Uh, if, if you don't, um, these are here for you to so you can review uh, again. And 
I think the previous seminar videos already expired, but I, I do plan on having those uploaded at some point, as I mentioned. So I'm just going to quickly skip through these. Uh, if you need to, to read them or want to know more about them, you can recheck the video again later. Right. So a recap of the previous seminar. So last time again, we talked about income strategies. And so this is where we are selling or writing options out, right? So for income strategies, the main benefit is data. Data is on your side and data is time, right? So normally when you own options contracts, data eats into your profits because as time passes on, the probability of your contract going in the money decreases or, or having the contract go more in the money if it is already in the money. And so because of that, the probability of gains decreases, right? And that's why data uh, is eating away at your profits because, you know, every single day um, you will lose the amount of data from the premium of your contract. And actually data is, is throughout the day. It will constantly decrease throughout the day or it will eat your premium throughout the day. Uh, but data is the value that you would expect it to drop on a one day basis. So that's what that variable is, right? So for income strategies, it's different because data is actually on your side because you're selling the contract. So we want time to burn away those contracts until it expires worthless. So we hit max profits, right? So the examples of those income strategies were, that we mentioned last time were covered calls, cash secured puts, credit spreads, and calendar spreads. We already talked about two of these now. We just need to talk about cash secured puts and credit spreads, which we will briefly go over credit spreads today. Um, so last time we talked about covered calls. So for covered calls, it's a relatively safe play because uh, you own 100 shares and then you're selling, or you own multiples of 100 shares and you're selling those contracts. So uh, regardless of how the things turn out, um, you know, you're, you're at worst, if someone exercises those call contracts, you'll just lose your shares but you're selling it at a higher price than what it was when you originally opened up your covered calls. So you're just limiting your profits, but you're minimizing your downside risk because now you have that extra premium to cover downside because you're selling those contracts. Uh, and, and I'll just go over the actual example I used last time. Uh, these are just some slides on data. Uh, basically data, um, data decay increases the closer you get to expiration, right? So we talked about this last time, so I'm gonna skip over these slides again, uh, but they are here for you to reference. So the actual example I used last time was EBON, so that was, um, or E-B-O-N, it's a crypto-related ticker. And actually, before I get into this, I'm gonna check with the chat real quick to see if there's anything new. All right, so I see somebody was asking about, will this cover Greeks? Uh, so I'm not going to be covering Greeks in depth, but I will like kind of quickly, like briefly try to explain what it is as I go through the lesson. I did talk about Greeks more in my first session. Um, but you know, if you still have questions about Greeks at the very end, you can ask me in, in the Q&A session, or I'm sure some of the folks in chat can help you out too. Um. Buffering a lot. <laughs> I I am streaming from a uh, very potato laptop, so if it's if it's I don't know if it's lagging or something, it might be that. But chances are, it's probably more just from from streaming in general. Uh, but yeah, I am on a potato laptop, so there's not really much I can do on my end. It's not like I have that much open. Um, but hopefully that, you know, that resolves for you and doesn't buffer as much later. Uh, so, okay, going to the example here, on Ebon. Uh, so this was a crypto related ticker. Um, and this lesson was on cover calls was two weeks ago. So, you know, during that time, there was a lot of hype on, on crypto, right? BTC was hitting new highs, Bitcoin uh, went up to like 50, 58,000, right? So, and now I think it's sitting at about 48,000 last time I saw this morning, right? So it's um, scaled back quite a bit. And actually, 
you might notice that crypto and the regular stock markets have a high correlation. It didn't used to be that way, uh, but now I notice that they pretty much follow each other. Um, anyways, uh, Ebon is a, in that crypto business. They're a little bit of a uh, not proven company, so it's really a, a hype ticker. And, and just full disclosure, um, <laughs> anything I mention in this seminar is, you know, for educational purposes only. Uh, not really a buy and sell recommendation. I will share what I'm doing, but it's just what I think. And, uh, you know, do your own research, right? I took this play because I was betting on the crypto hype and not so much on the actual fundamentals of the company. Like, you know, if, if the things happen that they are announcing work out, it could make a turn out a profit, right? But uh, chances are this is just a big hype. Hype kind of ticker, right? And so I was just trying to play that. And at that time, I uh, decided, you know, it was worth risking a little bit. So I took 200 shares of it. Uh, and the price of that was, as you see here, $2,337 in this top top box right here, right? So this was from uh, two, two or two, two and a half weeks ago. That's when I took this play. So, and then I sold the March 19th, 15 calls, right? So this is what it means by covered call. It's covered because I own shares and, and um, I sold these calls, which means I have to deliver these shares if it hits this strike and someone exercises it, right? So it cost me 2,300 to own these 200 shares. And uh, I sold the $15 calls strike and I gained about $750 for it, right? Because I sold these 15C of March 19th at 375 each, approximately. So I reduced my total cost of the play to $1,589, right? So at that time when I did the lesson, I was green on this trade by about uh, $266. So, so it, was, it was great at the time, right? Because uh, at that time, crypto was still going up. So with the market down trading, uh, this play has turned quite red. But this covered call position helped to reduce my loss in the play overall. So if I had just owned instead, if I had been bullish and aggressive and I had just owned this 15 call strike, these 15 call strikes are pretty much worthless now, right? Because right now, Ebon is trading at about 5 to $6, um, I think. Uh, let's see, what, what does it say here? Okay, so it's trading at 540 So I took the screenshot this morning, and I have these 200 shares, and now they are worth 540 So the total, total value of the play is uh, $1,222, right? So you see... Uh, I actually bought back these calls already because they were pretty much worthless. I, I think I bought them back for like uh, maybe like $50 each or something like that. So I already collected about $600, $700 of profit here on on this. So if I hadn't done this and covered calls and I had instead owned calls or if I had just owned shares, I would be a lot more red right now. I would be down $1,100. But instead, because I collected this premium and I covered it at about $100, I'm actually only down about maybe $300 to $400 instead of $1,100. So obviously the trade is still down. Not a great play, right? But the thing is, it shares. If crypto pops up, I still have a chance to make profit. And I don't have a time limit on that, right? But, you know, uh, it was a risky trade. It didn't turn out you know, the best, but because I had covered call position, my cost of the play is significantly reduced and I didn't eat as much of a loss so far. Uh, if, if the, you know, the stock goes back up, then I'll be fine. And I would have, you know, reduced the cost of my play. This would have been pure profit, right? Because I sold these and I bought them back for less. So, uh, you know, that's the advantage of covered calls. And, and the reason... You might be wondering, like, why did we even go over covered calls two weeks ago? I don't know if you've noticed, but in the past two weeks or so, especially this past week, 
the markets have been moving down a lot. We had a you know a pullback, right? And and Nasdaq actually had a correction. It was over a ten percent drop on Nasdaq. S and P five hundred less. It was closer to like five or six percent, I think. So that's more of a pullback, right? But the reason why we went over these last time, these cover calls, is because they can help reduce your potential loss. We went over them last time because they give you additional downside protection. And in the event the stock goes up, you're saying that I am going to sell whatever, you know, whatever stock you own, I'm going to sell it at this strike price, which is still above, right, above what it is currently at. When you take those covered calls, you're going to be selling out of the money's call strikes. So you're collecting this premium, right? In this case, it was $750 for me. If it goes up to this price, I have to sell at $15. But at that time, Ebon was $12, right? I still would have profited an additional $280-ish per share. And I collected this premium of $750. So in reality, it would be like me selling it at, you know, um, sorry, I forgot to divide this by two. But I'll be, you know, it, it would be like I sold Ebon at $18 if this went into the money. But if it didn't go to money, this acts as protection. So I got more downside protection. And that's why we went over covered calls last time. Because, you know, you have to be able to adapt to the situation in the market. Be able to cover yourself, essentially. Protect your profits. And still have the ability to earn in case of upside. So uh, covered calls, excellent strategy to use. Better to use when it is in a neutral, bullish situation. So in reality, we still want this to uptrend. Ideal situation is the calls expire worthless at $15. Exact on March 19th, because that means our shares went up by $2 something, and the calls expire at $0. And then we would collect that extra premium, right? And then we would just get sell another strike, another further strike out. Say April 16th calls for 18C or something like that, right? But um, this is the point of cover calls. You know, you just keep collecting that profit and then you protect yourself from additional downside. Best to use it when we are in a neutral, slightly bullish situation. But if we, you know, end up in some downside, it offers a little bit of protection as well. So I was protected on this up to about $7. We obviously went below that. So that's why this play is no longer profitable. Uh, but yeah, it did provide me with that extra additional protection and uh, I highly encourage you guys to take a look more at covered calls in the future if you guys um, need to. But hopefully everyone, you know, survived this past week and are doing fine. Um, you know, I, I do think that, you know, this bull market isn't over. It's just a lot of FUD right now about yields and everything like that. But um, at the same time, you know, be careful about buying every bounce because markets did bounce back up yesterday. Uh, and we did pass the stimulus bill, but I believe that we already kind of knew that the stimulus bill was going to be passed. Like, it's nothing new. Like, we've been moving up on stimulus news this whole time, right? So that's why I, I think that, you know, it's best to play safe right now, more scalping, more safe plays. Um, if you're going to take plays, do spreads or something like that, right? And that's what we're going to talk about today. So what are vertical spreads? Getting into the actual meat of today's lesson. Uh, I think I spent a little bit too much time covering covered calls, but hopefully that was uh, explained why we talked about that last time. And so there's always a reason why we're talking about what we talk about. So vertical spreads is when you buy and sell two different strikes on the same expiration date. I'll go over some examples later, but they can be either calls or puts. And the two main types of vertical spreads are going to be your debit and your credit spreads. Uh, and then due to time constraints, I think I mentioned this earlier, but we're primarily going to be focusing on debit spreads today. Uh, and then we'll touch lightly on credit spreads. But we'll go over credit spreads in more detail in a future session. I'll still talk about them today, just that we won't be like going over examples and how to find them and what the best ideal situations to use them are. I'm going to catch up with chat here real quick. Uh, 
Um, okay, so just to add on to, I see there's some questions about like buying back or discussion about buying back and whatnot. Uh, I could have expired, let it expire worthless, but what I did was I actually rolled it. So I bought it back at 100, uh, about $100, so about $50 each. And then I actually sold a, a closer strike, right? So I was still feeling really, really bearish. And I was like, there's not that much value left in these 15 strikes. So I actually went and sold a closer dated, closer strike on the play. Um, and that's that's why I actually closed that out. So in reality, norm, in normal situation, most of the time, you're probably just going to let it you know, go all the way to expiration and expire with list because you collect the full premium on that. Uh, but for me, I decided to roll it closer to a closer strike and a closer expiration date um, because I felt like the premium on the 15C was basically already almost max profit, right? So that's what I did on that. Um, but, you know, you have to assess the situation and constantly see what the market conditions are to determine what the best plan for this trade is. Like another reason to possibly close out the credit spread, if it's, you know, almost worthless, for example, like say it lost 90% of its value already since you opened it. Say you expected, you know, the underlying asset to bounce up again, and that it's hit support already and that the premium is probably already at the lowest, then that would be another time where you could consider doing that, right? Because basically you're going long on the stock again by selling like full long by selling, um, or not selling, buying back those contracts. But it's just something that you have to assess uh, on a stock-to-stock -stock basis. Um, so uh, on the high IV stuff, you know, it's versus like a safe cover call would be selling uh, calls on the slow mover because you just collect that premium, right? And that's a real income strategy. And and then the other strategy is the selling the high IVs, uh, which of course, when you have a high IV, that means the stock is very volatile. It might be in a parabolic motion. So that means, mean that it has a large chance to drop quickly as well. And that's what happened with EBON, right? So there's 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 two different uh, play styles. Uh, it, it's really up to you up to the individual to decide which style they want to go for in place, right? So there is, there's usually no real right or wrong in, in option strategies. Uh, it's just a matter of your risk tolerance, your risk profile, and what you think is the current play going in. All right. Yes, um, so Horizontal spreads are calendar spreads. And, and we went over that in the first seminar. But there are definitely a lot of other types of spreads, right? But I'm only specifically going to be going over vertical spreads today. And and for vertical spreads, those going to be debit and credit spreads. Um, eventually, the plan is over time, we're going to go over pretty much every single option strategy there is out there. I'm not sure how long that will take, uh, but that's the plan. Okay, so next, uh, going over debit spreads. So debit spreads are directional option plays, right? So for these, you are going to be buying a closer strike, and then you're going to be selling a further strike on the same expiration date. And closer and further are relative to what the current price is, right? But the thing is that why it's called a debit spread is because there's a net capital outlay, meaning that you're paying for the play. So there's a debit to your account because you're paying for it. The direction, whether it's up or down, bull or bear, right? Depends on whether you're getting calls or puts. So if you're in a call debit spread, that means you're bullish. If you're in a put debit spread, that means you're bearish. Uh, and, and you can essentially think of them as a cheaper, less risky, and generally higher probably play than just having straight up calls or straight up puts and we'll go over a little bit more in detail in that in a few slides later uh, but the primary advantages of a debit spread is again it's, it's cheaper to play because you're offsetting the cost to play by selling a further out of the money option 
So by selling that fur out of the money option, you're collecting that credit, right? So then that means your total cost of the play is less. Uh, so generally speaking, there's less risk because you're putting less money into the market. But the disadvantage to that is that you're limiting profit, right? So your max profit is going to be the difference between, you know, the call that you bought and the call that you sold. So once you hit a certain point, you're not going to be able to generate any additional profit from that play. You're going to be at max profit. And there's also the disadvantage of getting assigned on the play, meaning that you get closed out of your play early. Um, but usually when that happens, it, it means that you're, you're at max profit already, so it doesn't, doesn't matter that much. Um, but, you know, there's a chance of getting assigned. Uh, and then what are credit spreads? So credit spreads are also, again, directional option place, right? So you're going to... Yep, this is right. Buy the further strike, and you're going to sell the closer strike on the same expiration date. And this is where you're going to have a net capital inflow, or in other words, credit. So by um, buying the further strike, the further strike is always going to be cheaper than the closer strike to the current price action, right? So that's going to be um, cheaper. And then you're going to sell the closer strike. And that closer strike is going to be worth more because there's a higher chance for it to go in the money. Or if it's already in the money, then there's a higher chance for it to continue to be more deep in the money, right? So because of that, you're going to have a net inflow of capital. So it's credit. So you're going to pick up that premium money. And basically, it's the opposite of a debit spread, right? You're just playing the exact same thing, except you're on the opposite end now. So the direction is the same thing based on whether it's a call or a put, but it's flipped in regards to a debit spread. And this is a income-based strategy because data actually works to your advantage if your spread is near or in the money. Um, and so over time, you will see that the value of the spread decreases meaning that the cost for you to buy back the credit, or the, essentially is buying back a debit spread, right? Because it's reverse, uh, will be cheaper. So as time passes, the value of the spread decreases as long as it's out of the money, right? And then you'll collect that full premium that you, uh, or you have to pay back less, um, depending on what happens. So this is just a table of all those spreads explaining uh, each of the different ones, uh, just and when you would use them or when I would use them. So I split them between calls and puts. So first off, we have our bowl called debit spreads. So for this, it's again, it's basically like owning um, just calls, right? Except that you're limiting your risk. So you use this when you're bullish on an asset, but want to limit the capital outlay, so you want to limit the cost of it as well as the risk of the play. So you use this mostly when you are, quote, moderately bullish, right? Because if you're very bullish, so there's a lot of momentum in, the, in uh, a particular asset and it's going up really fast, then usually you don't probably don't want to use a spread as much. Instead, you can just get calls, right? Because if it's moving up really quickly, you can capture the most benefit from just straight up calls. But if you're just moderately bullish, like maybe there's gonna be some pullback or it's gonna climb up, but it's gonna be a little bit slower uh, and maybe take some time to do it, then a spread is to your advantage because it costs less and you have the, um, the option that you sold to offset any downside risk of like data burning into your uh, contracts. So the pros of it, again, cheap, well-defined risk, Cons limit profit, right? Compared to just straight up calls, data works against you uh, still, but it's not as bad as a uh, just a straight up call. And then you can get assigned um, if someone executes or exercises uh, the call that you sold. Uh, but again, this generally isn't a big deal because that means that your other play or your this, the leg that you did buy is in the money. So you are green on the play regardless. Uh, now we're going to talk about bear call credit spreads, right? So a call credit spread by its nature is bearish. 
Uh, I just put ball bear. I like put the full name of these spreads in here, even though you won't see people normally call them like that. Uh, just so everybody's clear on on what they're called. Uh, but use these in high volatility situations when you are neutral bearish. And so the reason why you use them in high volatility situations is because when the IV is high, that means the premium is high. And so there are actually some situations where you can get ridiculous prices or premiums on those credit spreads you're selling. Uh, I remember in back in January when GME was running up real crazy, there were some credit spreads that you could take where you would be able to get like 90% of the full width of, of that um, play. Like, um, so for example, like if it was GME 100 to 110 C, uh, and, and you sold the 100 and you bought the 100 or 110, you know, the max cost or the max loss of that play is going to be $10, right? Because that's the width of your spread. And, you know, because of the high volatility situation, all the premiums were very high and very close together. And because the spread was so wide, if you got lucky, you could get filled for, say, like, just for example, $9 out of 10. So you, you'd get $900 to take on a risk of paying out 10. So that means your max loss was $100. And if, you know, GME closed below 109, you would be anything else was extra. Um, but yeah, in those high volatility situations, sometimes you can get really, really good deals essentially on selling these uh, spreads, which is a credit spread. So the pros, again, for these strategies is the income strat. Um, so theta is on your side. As, uh, you know, usually your higher value call, which you are selling, is going to decrease in value faster than the call that you um, bought. And so that means that you're going to profit off of that data difference, right? And generally, there's a, a higher probability of success for credit spreads. Um, and the cons to it is that usually there's a small credit or profit, and you can also get assigned on it. Uh, so usually for credit spreads, it's unusual to see those situations where you can get profit um, on something that is reasonable to play, right? Like a reasonable price target, um, because you can always adjust your strikes until you find something that gives you a lot of a lot of credit, right? But then it's maybe it's not as likely to play out or something like that, right? Um, so compared to debit spreads, usually for credit spreads, it has a higher probability uh, of success, but usually the gains relative is smaller. But it all balances out in the end, right? Debit and credit spreads are just two sides of the same coin. Really, the most important thing is when you take these plays is you're assessing the chart, you're seeing where support and resistance are, and that's why you take the play. And both of them are great strategies to use. Uh, so moving on to bear put debit spread. So this is the same thing as, as like a bull call debit spread, except that you're betting on downside. So you use it when bearish on an asset, but again, want to limit capital outlay or risk. Not going to go over the pros and cons because it's, it's basically the same as a call debit spread. Um, and then we have our bull put credit spreads. Why is it bullish? Because we're collecting... Uh, premium value and we are hoping that the stock goes up right so we use it when we are neutral bullish on a stock in high volatility situations because we think that the stock is going to go up so we're going to collect the full premium of the spread and we won't have to pay out on the spread right um, but same thing as as the bear call credit spread except again it's it's bullish right because we're selling net selling on puts so hopefully that wasn't too confusing. Uh, might not have explained it that well. Uh, if you guys have questions, yeah, definitely feel free to ask. So yeah, on the assignment for the spreads, uh, because you own the other, you own the other leg. You should never. Like it should never really matter. Like you would still, you can still get assigned on the spread, right? 
But the thing is, your other leg offsets it, so it doesn't it doesn't matter. Uh, but it's still called an assignment, and you can still get assigned on it. In the situation where you get assigned on a spread, I'll go over more over this later. I actually went and asked Robinhood support because I know most people are are using Robinhood. What they do, uh, and we'll go over that later. I have I have some slides on that, so we'll talk about that later. Uh, but yeah, basically what JTW is saying is correct. Usually, you you don't. It's not something you have to worry about. Uh, and even if it does happen, you know it's it's in the money. It doesn't matter. Uh, <laughs> So how to play debit spreads. Uh, so you're going to buy the closer strike and sell the further strike. And, and then when to use it. Anytime you would want to get a call or put on a play. So again, those, those just straight up calls or puts. But you want to limit the cost or the risk. And also when the asset is not in a momentum move. Because if it is moving up real quick, real fast, usually that's a momentum play. And you're just going to want to play a call or a put and you don't need to use a spread uh, and the other time you would use it is when you need to manage a portfolio with appropriate sizing and risk management in general so say for example you want to play amazon calls and they cost i don't know 29 dollars or something for something that's a hundred dollars out of the money in a week right that, that's probably not too unusual for amazon because amazon's expensive to play so that's going to cost you like two thousand nine hundred dollars for one contract now, not everybody can play that, right? Or, or even if you can, maybe you don't want to spend that much money on a play. Uh, and it just goes back into portfolio risk management, right? Like if your account size is, say, only $10,000, do you really want to put $3,000 or about one-third of your portfolio into one play? Like, sure, you can do that if you want to, but it's I wouldn't recommend it because it's not very good uh, sizing for your portfolio. So in these kinds of scenarios, that's where you would use a spread. Because by using a spread, you can reduce the capital of that play and allow you to size in more appropriately so you can play different stocks and different tickers so that you're not basically all in on one play. And if that goes down, you're, you know, you're, you're out of the game. We want to reduce the chance of that happening. And so with these debit spreads, you reduce that cost of the play and you can still benefit from that upside. So for example, if anybody in, uh, for example, if you're following someone in X trades and you, they play something really expensive and you can't follow them or you can follow them, but it's something that outsizes, you know, your standard portfolio position size. For myself, you know, I recommend, you know, no more than 10% of your portfolio should be in one play, right? And, and this really depends on your portfolio size, right? Like. Really, it should be less than that, but I know some folks probably don't have large portfolio sizes, so you know you can give a little bit more leeway right there. But in those events, you can actually consider taking a debit spread instead of just or taking the um, whatever their play was. So you know, in order to decide what strike you're selling, though, you're gonna have to take a look at the chart and identify where support or resistance is, depending on which side you're playing. If you're playing calls. You're going to want to sell the strike that is at a strong resistance. So maybe not at price target one, but at price target two, you're going to sell that strike. Because, you know, when that hits that, maybe it rejects, right? And at that point, that's where you can maximize your debit spread, um, the advantages of a debit spread. Okay, so the Greeks, mostly the similar with just um, regular calls or puts, right? So if it's calls... That you're playing for a debit spread is going to be positive delta and um and then for puts it's going to be negative right and so the general guideline on spreads so when you're going to play these um you're going to have a net delta right the general guideline for these most commonly recommended is 30 delta again these are just general guidelines you're going to just going to have to assess this based on your own play style right but most quote unquote professionals are going to be recommending around this 30 delta, which, you know, is like a golden number to them. Uh, and I think that's that's perfectly fine if you need to use those general guidelines. But once you have a good grasp on trading, the market, charting, 
then you can really just base these positions off of where you identify support or resistance. And I'll probably go through a chart later to um, explain in detail like how I picked my place uh, when I go over actual place I did take. And then theta is negative, uh, as mentioned earlier. And when to close, uh, if it's in the money already before expiration, usually I just close it at 90 to 95% of profit. Uh, in reality, you know, if you wait all the way up to expiration, you can get 100% of max profit, right? But you, you really rarely ever hit max theoretical profits. And you also run the risk of, say, the stock turning back down on you, and then you're losing, um, you know, the max profit, right? You're not going to hit the max profit. Uh, if it's really, really deep in the money, I mean, sure, you could just wait, right? And then, you know, you let the, let the spread exercise and all of that. But um, usually for myself, if it's before the expiration date and it's already in the money and it's around 90 to 95% of the profit, I just close it out because usually that means that I can just roll out that money into a different play to capture additional gains. Because at 90 to 95% profit, there's, you're waiting and you have that risk of additional downside to your play um, for what, just an additional 5 to 10%. It's usually not worth it to me. Uh, but again, this is something that you have to decide on your own. Uh, otherwise, you know, if it's not in the money, then usually I close it when uh, I see the trade is basically reversing. So it basically has hit a support or a resistance area and the trade is reversing, then I'm going to close that spread. That's the same thing that you would do for regular excuse me, regular calls or puts, right? Um, the only difference between a regular call and put is here that, you know, I would close if it's in the money, if it's 90 to 95% in profit already. Because we have a defined max profit as well as a defined risk. So usually, um, again, use these when you're moderately bullish or bearish on a stock. If you are very bullish or bearish on a stock, that's when you just use calls or puts. So debit spreads, uh, some definitions here. So spread width or sp strike differential. Um, so that's the difference between, you know, the strike that you're buying and the strike that you're selling. So this is going to be the max theoretical value of the play and your debit spread cost. So the cost it takes for you to open the play is going to be your max loss of the play, right? You can't lose more than what you're putting into the play. Um, that's how that works. So a bullish example here, uh, gas, oil has been bullish lately, XOM, CVX, USO, all of them have been very bullish. Commodities in general have been great, except for like gold. Uh, even if you look at soybeans, that has been going up for the past, since March, basically last year, right? So uh, anyways, that's why I have this example here. But say that you buy to open XOM 60C and you sell to open XOM 65C. So your max value of that play is going to be 65 because that's the call that you sold and then um, versus the call that you bought, which was 60. So the difference between that is $5. So that means you know the max value of that spread is $500. So your max profit is going to be 500 minus the cost of the debit spread, which is whatever you paid uh, for that 60C minus that 65C, right? Um, so just say, for example, I don't know what the actual prices are right now, but say, for example, the 60C is uh, for, for March 19th is a $1.70. And say that the 65C is, I don't know, 80 cents or something. That means that my net cost is going to be 90 cents. So your max profit is going to be $410 and uh, your max loss is going to be $90, right? So that's a really, really good ratio, right? For something that is highly probable. Of course, I don't know if those are the actual numbers, but for example. And a bear example here, uh, this was a play that I actually took. So if you buy the open Tesla 600p and then uh, I put an at sign here, but it's actually supposed to be and sign sell to open a Tesla 580p. So the max value of this play or the spread is going to be 600 minus 580 or $20. So that's the difference between it, right? So that means if Tesla closes below 580, and I should have mentioned this earlier with XOM, that max profit is achieved when XOM is over 65 before 
or by ex at expiration, right? So uh, for, for the Tesla example, if Tesla is below 580p at say 319, if, if those that's the date I picked for um, my spread, then this is gonna be at max value, which is $20, and my max profit is gonna be $2,000. So same thing, it's just minus whatever the cost of that debit spread is for your max profit, your actual max profit, uh, and your max loss is whatever you paid out for that play. Uh, and so you might be wondering, why would I take a spread instead of just, say, taking up, instead of saying, um, for example, in Tesla here, why would I sell the open the 580p when I could just hold the 600p long, right? Like, is, what's the advantage of that? The real advantage here is because of, again, risk. So it costs less to play as well. And also, um, if, you know, Tesla closes at exactly 580, at expiration, this play will be worth more, right? Because the 580, uh, actually, if it closes at 580p, so it will be worth, your, your 600p will be worth $20 or $2,000, right? If Tesla closes at 580 on at expiration but you have reduced the cost of that play by selling to open the 580p so say that it costs ten dollars to get that 600p now but you sold the 580p at five dollars right so it costs you five dollars for the play instead ten dollars so the difference is going to be in that profit is going to be 20 minus 10 which is ten dollars versus 20 minus 5 which is 15 dollars so basically in a situation where you are only moderately bearish or you expect that, you know, the stock isn't going to go all the way down, you're always going to find uh, for bears, for a bear debit spread or like a, what is it, a put debit spread, you're always going to pick your sell to open at a support point that you don't think Tesla has a strong chance of passing, but maybe it'll pass it, right? So that's, that's really the difference there. But also because you're reducing the cost of the play, say an example, it's uh, $10 for the 600p and $5 for the 580p. Instead of owning just one 600p, you could instead own two, right, 600 to 580ps. Because that would cost you a total of $1,000 for that spread. And if Tesla closes at exactly 580p, for example, then your play is going to be total, the value of the spreads are going to be worth $4,000 minus $1,000. So you're going to have a net game of $3,000. Versus if you had just bought say 600p for $10 and you didn't sell to open the 580p, that'll be $10. And um, the max value of that spread is, or sorry, if it's a 580p, your, your 600p is gonna be worth $20. So that'll be 20 minus 10. So you, you only make $1,000, right? So the advantage here is that you can scale in more because it's cheaper. And um, the disadvantage is that if Tesla closes well below 580p, for example, at $500 or something, then in that situation, that's where your spread will lose out. But if you, you know, identify a good support, then this is where you would use that debit spread. Um, let's go into an actual example so it's it's a little bit more clear. So this is the options chain on Tastyworks. This is an example of a Tesla vertical bear spread, or in other words, a bear put debit spread. Uh, and here I have picked the 600 and 580p. I probably should have just gone in here in the first place because there are actual numbers. Uh, but here you see that, you know, the net debit is about $8.75, right? See, see the limit price here? So this is taking the average between the bid and ask for both of these. So, um, let's see here. Again, you know, I, I don't think I'm going to actually go over this again because it's the same thing. But basically, your max value of this spread is, is $2,000 at expiration, right? So you're paying $875 for the potential to uh, get back $2,000. So your max profit would be $11.25 or $1,125 if Tesla closes at or below 580 at expiration on March 19th, 2021, which is uh, the expiration of these contracts. Now, look at how expensive these contracts are. 
A 600p right now costs about $42 ish, right? Like, what if Tesla only goes down to 580 by 319 for some reason, right? Or it bounces back up, whatever, something like that happens. Then that means you're paying, <laughs> you, you wouldn't even make any money on the play because you'd be paying $4,200 and your 600p would only be worth uh, $2,000 if Tesla is at 580. So that means you would lose $2,000, $2,200. So uh, when you see these situations where something is really, really volatile, so Tesla has been moving a lot, down a lot this past week. And so right now, these premiums are probably a little bit shot up compared to normal. I mean, Tesla premiums are usually pretty high regardless, right? But this is where you would use a spread because it makes you a lot cheaper to play. 875 versus $4,200, right? 875 versus $4,200. If you're super bearish on Tesla, then maybe you could consider a naked, <laughs> a naked uh, put, right? Or not naked put, just, just a regular put, right? But, you know, chances are, probability are that a spread is usually going to pay out better than just taking a regular call or put, unless you are super bearish on it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you can take it. And if Tesla, you know, tanks to 500 on Monday or something like that, you will probably make a money, uh, a lot of money on that, and you can just sell it, right? You wouldn't wait till expiration. But if you're waiting, you know, for a longer term play, like a couple week play, or you want to swing something, I think spreads usually are a lot better. If you're just playing a momentum type play again, naked calls or not naked calls, just straight up calls and puts are better. Um, all right, so actual example from this week. So, uh, it, you know, if you're a part of the X-Trades, you've probably seen me talk about Tesla for like two or three days now. <laughs> I've basically been rolling uh, different puts on Tesla this whole time, but here's an example that I took on my Robinhood Challenge account. So I took, uh, it says zero now because I closed this out. So I, I got this spread for $1,025 and I sold it at $2,850 yesterday, right? So I profited $1,825 on this play, which is more than double, right? It's like 170, 180% win. Uh, if you look at how expensive these contracts are, my challenge account cannot afford these puts. <laughs> at least not without oversizing in the position, right? So um, that's another reason why I took these spreads. But I, what I did was I bought the 695p and I sold the 665p. So my max profit here was 3000 And that's why when on Friday, when I had the opportunity to, I just closed it out at 2850 because that's over 90%. In fact, I think this is exactly 95%. Uh, 950 times 3 is 2700 plus 150. Yeah, 2850. So I closed it at exactly 95%. So I followed my rules here. I closed it out. Uh, you know, in reality, Tesla did end up, I think it was below 600. So in reality, this could have been worth $3,000, right? Um, so I missed out on that additional quote unquote 150, but at 90 to 95%, I consider that a good trade and I am willing to close it out in, in, with the possibility that, you know, Tesla could bounce because, uh, midday, I think on Tesla, early to midday on Tesla and the rest of the market as well, they all drop real low in the morning and they all started bouncing. So I just close out the play. Didn't want to worry about it. I was already 90 to 95% max profit. There wasn't any reason for me to risk, you know, possibility of it losing value for an additional $150, right? Like, it's already a really, really good play. So uh, I just took profits on that. So let's look at the actual charts to see why I did what I did. Um, give me one second here. I'm going to pull up my browser. And I will check out the chat. Yes, so for spreads, I always close them out at the same time.
I see that uh, JTW and 007 have been pretty much covering the chat here, so <laughs> thanks for all the help. All right, so let's look at Tesla here on the charts to see why they why did, right? Uh, so you've probably all seen this chart already. I'm kind of bearish on Tesla, right? I think I think it's overpriced and overvalued. But I recognize also that uh, it's bounced off of this trend line here, exact on the dot. Um, this trend line when uh, Tesla was consolidating before the um, S&P 500 inclusion news, right? So this consolidation triangle is right before the S&P 500 inclusion news, which caused this gap up from 413 to 433. And then since then, it, it just kept going up. And then it actually got added on December 21st, somewhere over here. Uh, and, it, you know, the rest is history, right? And now I consider it extremely overvalued. And so it's starting to go down. And I think that it needs to fill this gap. But we, I, I mean, I don't know if that's going to happen or not. Uh, but one interesting thing here is that it bounced perfectly. As you can see, this huge wick right here. Let's, let's change to the uh, four hours. Oh, I don't have that trend line on my four hour chart for some reason. Uh, but anyways, you can see that red wick here on Tesla uh, right here, and it bounced perfectly off this trend line. So, you know, it, and I printed a hammer, right? So I'm not really convinced that Tesla is done dropping yet, but at the same time, it did hit a major support level and bounce off of it. Uh, and, and I closed out, you know, those spreads for this past week. But looking closely, so 15 minute chart here. So I opened these plays on, I think I opened them on the second. March 2nd, and I close them out on the 4th. Let me take a look at <laughs> the PowerPoint again. Yep. So, 2nd and the 4th, right? Today is the 6th. So, that means I closed them out on Thursday. I didn't even close them out on Friday. So, that's the real reason why I closed them out. So, I closed them out on Thursday because I thought Friday... I, I, I didn't, there was no point in holding for one extra day for that potential risk of, I don't know, say it bounces up or something, right? Uh, I think I was seeing that it was holding this support here around $600 on Thursday. So I thought maybe it might bounce the next day. And so I just closed out that spread for 90, 95% profit on Thursday instead of waiting an extra day for that extra $150 max profit um, on the potential that maybe it just bounces up. Um, so that's why I actually close that play. So I opened Tesla that Tesla spread on March 2nd. So here uh, I had this descending trend, trend line going from from a bit back. Uh, you can see that it kind of breaks up and over it and but mostly acts uh, pretty solidly as resistance. And I think the reason why you can see this over over this trend line is mostly during the pre-market and after-hour times, which is this blue and uh, yellow area. Blue is the after-hours and yellow is the pre-market hours. So really, if we ignore all the um, extended hour information, in reality, Tesla has been following this trend line down this whole time. And so on March 2nd, I was I was tired of having seeing red on my portfolios, right? I was like, I need to short something. And I was like, you know, Tesla, I think is overvalued. It looks weak. It's been downtrend for, um, how long has, it, has Tesla been in a downtrend, actually? It's been in a downtrend for a whole month, actually, right? Since February 4th. So in reality, we could have been shorting this for like a whole month already. Um, and if somebody did that, man, that was, that's, that's massive profits right there. Uh, but anyways, I, I was like, I was tired of seeing red on my portfolio, so I wanted to take some puts. Uh, and I mentioned last week to 007, that I was feeling bearish on Tesla and I wanted to short it again. I didn't short it at that time, but I should have. Instead, I shorted NEO, uh, which also worked out great because, you know, the EV sector in general. Uh, but anyways, I took that here because I saw that it was rejecting this trend line again. And uh, I I'm, I'm found the levels for Tesla. So I was looking at this. I'm going to get rid of this extended 
data information is kind of in the way. Um, so my identify levels here, so you can see now that it's more perfectly following this trend line down, right? So the first thing I did was I identified the support and resistance after I identified this trend line. So I know Tesla's in the trend line, that's why I want to play puts. Then I identified the support and resistance. So I saw this gap here um, in February 22nd. So I marked these two areas of potential support and resistance areas, right? So that support gap is at 676. And this uh, gap top is at about 706 or 710. And so I was looking at this, and I actually took 710 puts as well, 710 to 700 puts. Uh, but I was looking at this, and I also saw that there was a pivot point right here at 660. And so that's why I picked what I did. It's because I was like, there's a possibility we go all the way back down here to 620 or so, which is um, where this initial gap down move went to. But there, we also bounced off. This is a major bounce off point, right? Around 660. And I was pretty confident that this gap top was now resistance because we had a uh, resistance here on the spike here. And then we also hit this descending trend line and we met with this um, gap fill top here. And it looked bearish, so I was like, okay, I am just going to take puts. And I picked 695 puts, because at the time I took the play, uh, Tesla was already at, I think, $700 or so. And I took 695 instead of taking 700 which is what I would more normally do, because I prefer, I prefer picking something like at the money for my leg one on my spreads. This is just my personal risk preference, right? I like doing that on Tesla and on spreads in general on highly volatile stocks because I feel more comfortable playing that way. Like I'm, I'm more comfortable feeling that, you know, this is going to hold versus not, right? So that it's going to be below 700. And so I picked 695 instead of 700, which is what I really wanted to play was 700. But I picked 695 because my account or my challenge account did not have enough extra funds in order to enter the play. So I did 695 and I sold 665 because I knew that 660 was a potential pivot point from before. So I did 665, which was a little bit higher than 660 because I didn't feel like, you know, the potential was fully there. Like I thought maybe, you know, I might just go up to 675, which was this gap. Uh, I'm over here and it might hold this as support because it kind of did that over here too, right? So I took this play and it actually it bounced off over that here as well on March 3rd. So on March 3rd, I was kind of like, man, maybe this bear play isn't isn't going to work out as well as I thought. I, I was still in profits, obviously, because we, we moved like $20 down from where I entered the position. But I saw this starting to bounce up over here off of this gap bottom. Uh, and so that's why I picked 60, 6, 65 because it was near or in between my price target areas that I felt like Tesla had a good chance of bouncing at. Um, and so that's why I took that play. And the rest is history. Once it broke under this pivot point, I was like, it's definitely going to 620. So my targets were 660 to 620. And I mentioned that in the options watch list. I also played this by taking um, March 19th put spreads, right? But uh, for the purposes of the play that expired this week, at this point, once it broke down 660, basically that play was already almost max profit, right? If you had waited until expiration, as long as it's below 665, that play would have been worth $3,000. Um, but I just took profits on March 4th instead of waiting an extra day because I felt that maybe it might bounce from this 620, 600 level in a strong Friday reversal. Uh, and we did see a reversal on Friday, but it wasn't until after it had dropped even more. Uh, if you look at the regular markets, this is my crypto watch list. And you go back to my stock watch list here. If you look at the regular markets, you will see that both the S&P 500 as well as NASDAQ closed green on the day. So, I mean, they all had this drop, but both the uh, S&P 500 as well as NASDAQ closed green on the day. That's what I thought was going to happen with Tesla as well as that it was going to close higher. But Tesla actually closed red, like down 3% versus the rest of the market, which is most of the most of the market is closing green on the day. So experience the same trend, 
but it was definitely more bearish. And this is why I am still holding put spreads on Tesla for March 19th, because it looks so much weaker compared to the rest of the market. Um, and, you know, full disclosure, I do have ARC calls as well. Uh, I haven't been posting much about it because those plays are practically dead. But basically, this Tesla put spread is my hedge against my ARC holdings. So that's that's what I'm doing here, because ARC holds a ridiculous amount of Tesla. 9.99% the last time I checked. It used to be over 10%, actually. But <laughs> because Tesla dropped so much in value, it's only 9.99% right now, which is their largest holding. So that's why I'm shorting Tesla, um, because it looks weak compared to the rest of the market. It is considered what I consider overvalued, my opinion, right? But yeah, that's that's why I did and how I picked it. Now, looking further, if I were to play another put spread on Tesla, I would be looking for it to reject from this level right here about 605 to 610. Right, we have a pivot point right here. We see it bounce over here before off this level. And remember support and resistance lines are always more like zones, right? It's, it's not exact, right? You have to have some leeway. So that's what we're looking at here is, is a rejection of 610 for further downside. You see that it kind of, um, these candles over here are basically poking at this level, but it doesn't want to break out this level yet. And so this is what I would be looking for for additional further downside. If we don't uh, break over this level, then, you know, I, I can see a high probability that we're going to retest this level right here, which is 540. So if I were to play a put spread and I saw a rejection here at 6, 610 or so, I'd probably play something like 610 to 540, right? Or if you were more aggressive, you could do something cheaper, which would be like 560, which is a, another resistance. Or maybe you could use the VVAP, which is about 580, and then you would sell... Um, 540p or if you wanted to be more conservative again you can go a little bit higher like 550 or uh, even this pivot point right here where this um, where we had this engulfing bullish candle right so you could instead pick you know 550 and you can sell or not sell you can buy 580p sell 550p or something like that uh, and watch out for this 565 line to see if it acts as a potential resistance, right? But really, we're looking at this trend line here. I think that's the real reason why we bounced. Um, we hit this trend line, we bounced off of it. There was also, this is also the pivot point, the pivot high right here um, is what I am looking for next. But yeah, I, I got some really, really aggressive put spreads. I picked 450 to 400p, I think, on Tesla. And there's a reason for that, and I'm going to talk about that now in the next slide. Yeah, in general, for spreads, I um, saw somebody was asking about expiration. Usually your expiration, you're just going to pick it based on what you expect from the chart, right? That's how I play it. And then on top of that, I always add time to the play. So like why I pick March 19th? Because based on this trend, Tesla could easily just plunge to the deaths in a week instead of two weeks, right? Like based on how, how it's been moving, right? Uh, that's because I'm just giving myself additional insurance or time for this play to play out in case it doesn't go 100% my way. Maybe it bounces up and then it goes down or something like that. Like giving myself time will allow me to more easily play that. Um, but really March 19th really is a big lotto uh, on this. And that's that's why it's I'm not playing that big and it's only on my challenge account that I'm doing this on. Um, but yeah, it, it is definitely a risky play. Usually for plays, I like to pick monthly calls and I like to add one month to when, at least one month to when I expect a play to um, pan out. So that's that's my own personal uh, preference. But again, this is all based on risk tolerance. And I think JTW mentioned this too. 
Uh, for credit spreads, usually people play shorter time frames because they want theta to burn away the uh, premium of the closer contract, so they make more money on that uh, play faster. Uh, but yeah, you can pick something further out too, and I would recommend doing monthly still, but maybe instead of saying normally you would do like two or three months out, you only do one month out or something like that. And uh, the reason for picking monthlies again is because there is higher liquidity in the options contract. Right. So when you play weeklies, there's not as much volume or open interest in those contracts because institutions and stuff probably aren't playing those. And even um, non-institutional people like me, for example, who's retail, we prefer to play monthlies. And you will always see more volume on the monthlies and that provides better liquidity, which means that you will have better uh, bid ask differences so you can get better um, fills on your plays. And so, so that's why we like to play monthlies, right? So other considerations, uh, risk of assignment and exercise, right? So uh, for debit spreads, it's not really a concern for, for the assignment stuff. Uh, for credit spreads, it could be a bit more of a concern depending on whether both legs are in the money or those kinds of situations. Uh, but I contacted Robinhood support just to get an answer from them in regards to how they manage um, these spreads and what happens at expiration, just so that you guys can know. Uh, but other considerations other than that would be ex-dividend dates. So whenever there's a dividend on a stock, that value of that dividend is usually going to be taken out of that stock when that dividend is paid out, right? So for example, if... Um, I can't think of something with a dividend right now, but uh, I think Ford removed their dividend, but let's just say they still had a dividend. <laughs> say they had to pay a dividend of $0.25 cents or something like that per share, and uh, say Ford is trading at $10, then at the ex-dividend date, normally you would expect the price of the stock to drop because that value is being taken out of the asset. Um, in, in very simple terms, that's basically how you can think of that, right? So when that happens, that's going to affect the profitability of your plays. Um, this applies to not just spreads, but also just, just any play in general, right, for options. But that's something that you want to pay attention to because that can affect, you know, how likely your play is going to be in the money or out of the money based on um, what strike you picked. Because maybe that ex-dividend is going to take that play out of the picture or something like that. Uh, ER and volatility events are another big thing. So whenever you have ER volatility events, it may throw a wrench into your plans. Um, we all know how volatile ER can be. Stocks go up 10% or down 10%. I mean, different stocks react differently to ERs usually, but uh, in general, it's always risky to play over those volatility events. Um, but if you really do want to play over ER, a spread is the way to go, right? Because otherwise you're going to have high IV. So you're going to negate part of the IV with a spread. My favorite way to play ERs is, of course, the uh, calendar spread with high IV skew. Um, and that's because I'm, I'm just profiting off of basically somebody, a lot of interest in the close dated contracts. So the premium is overly high compared to the expected movement from the ER versus a further outstrike, which has less volatility, implied volatility to it because it's further away from the ER and most likely it's going to normalize by the time that play hits. So really all I'm doing is selling that uh, excess premium on the closer dated contract and counting on the further contract to maintain relative value. And so that's why I like to do ER calendar plays. Uh, I know a few folks have been messaging me lately with their calendar spreads and so far, I think people have been doing very well with them. Like, even when I don't alert anything, um, I've seen a lot of people DM me, like, plays where they go 50, 30 to 50% up. Uh, basically, you know, every other day of the week, they send me something, and I'm like, that's that's really impressive. Uh, but yeah, anyways, um, going over assignment and exercise. So, I, I, again, I emailed Robinhood, and I'm just going to read this. Uh, so, 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 they said... Prior to expiration, they will review the spread 60 to 90 minutes before market close on the spread's expiration date. At that point, a few different things can happen, right? So if both legs are in the money, 
the short leg may be assigned and the long leg may be exercised to offset the assignment. So spreads can be assigned if they are in the money. But the thing is, because you have a long leg, your broker may just exercise that for you to offset that assignment, especially if you don't have the capital or the shares to pay out for that for that assignment, uh, depending on whatever it was a, a put or a call um, spread, right? If both legs are out of the money and not at risk of being in the money at expiration, then both legs are going to expire worthless, um, which is great for a credit spread, right? And if it's a debit spread, then it's not that great because basically you, you, you're at max loss, right? You lost uh, whatever you put into that play. And then if one leg is at risk or in the money and you do not maintain the buying power or necessary collateral to support the exercise or assignment, they will just close out the whole spread for you. Um, and so again, you really don't have to worry about assignment because uh, pretty much all brokerages have a system to manage them appropriately based on your risk. The only issue here is, uh, and, and this applies to all brokers, but they all apply, like they all have different rules on how they do it. For Robinhood specifically, again, you have that 60 to 90 minutes before close and they do that risk check. The problem with this is that they will automatically sell your spread 60 to 90 minutes before close. And sometimes that means that you're going to be missing out on profits or losing out on profits that you did have. I can give you a good example for myself. For example, I had, um, I had a calendar spread on, I forgot what it was. I think it was Chewy, but I had a cal calendar spread a while back last year. And, um, you know, it, it wasn't in the money. It was, it was, <laughs> they were both out of the money, right? Um, the trade was green, but I had bought, I think it was like a hundred C or something like that. Uh, and I, I sold a hundred C that was closer dated. So say it was, I don't know, September or something. And then my further leg was in November. So I had, um, planned on just letting the closer leg, which was a September one expire out worthless. That was my plan. I just wanted to expire worthless to be worth zero dollars. So I collect the full premium of that play, right? While Chewy continues to slowly make its way up, right? Uh, but during the middle of the day, I saw that the contract for that was well, basically worth one cent, right? It was basically worthless because it was so far out of the money. And I, I originally sold it for, I think, like maybe uh, 35 to 40 cents, somewhere around there. So it, it's not like I made a lot from it. It was just like $35 for the contract, but it was a way for me to offset my calendar spread cost, right? Um, my longer leap, right? So, uh, you know, I was like, you know, I'm already in green and I can close it out now. But then I looked at the bid ask spread and they only do it in increments of five cents. <laughs> so basically, I had to either buy back the contract at zero cents and no one's going to sell it at zero cents or I had to buy it at five cents. So I was like, you know, whatever, I'm just going to let it expire worthless instead of try to close it out at one cent because I can't close it out at one cent because they have a minimum increment of five cents. So uh, with that said, I just waited throughout the day and it turned out at the end of the day, um, basically this risk check happened. They were like, well, I don't, I don't know why they did it that way. I think it's because my calendar spread, I opened each leg separately. So that's probably why I didn't handle it very well too. But uh, basically they try to close that leg out even though it was out of the money and it should just expire worthless. Uh, but they closed it out and they, they bought it back at nine cents and I was just livid because I was like, um, <laughs> basically I lost out on $4, which is not a big deal, right? But I, I was just like, dude, why didn't you just let it expire worthless? Why did you have to buy it back? And you bought it back. They probably just hit the bid to close it out, which was, I don't know, nine cents or whatever at the time. And I was like, I could have closed it out earlier in the day for, for five because there were people selling it for five cents, um, which is five dollars. Right. Uh, so anyways, that that is a risk factor. And it depends on your broker, how they manage those things. Uh, but that's also why if you have the chance to close out a spread, it's deep in the money or whatever. Um, this is why I close it out at 90, 95% now, because I don't want to risk the 
chance that Robinhood automatically decides on their own how to sell my spread or exercise it or something like that, and they give me a worse price than what I could have gotten, right? Uh, that's why I do that now. Whenever I hit 90-95% of max profits on debit spreads, I will close it out because of this experience. I don't want to experience that again and, and, and lose out on profits. Uh, I'm not really too mad about it because, you know, it, it was a green trade, right? I sold at 30-something um, cents and then it bought back at 9 cents. But the thing is, uh, if you had a lot of contracts or something like that, you know, it could it could add up over time, right? Or, or if for other plays that are more expensive, that, that could be a detriment to your portfolio. Um, but just something I want you guys to be aware about on how that works. Uh, specifically for Robinhood here, um, other brokers have similar risk assessments uh, and, and they will decide, they, have their, they all have their own rules on how they do that, right? But this is generally how most brokerages handle it. Okay, um, I'm gonna catch up with chat real quick here. Yeah, what uh, Bull Throttle was saying about the play less than cost cap profits. So you let, you know, cost less, limit profits, and it makes more sense on longer plays is completely true because the only time you are not going to want to use a debit spread is for a short term or shorter term momentum play, right? And that's what I keep saying. Basically, if you plan on swinging, spreads are usually a good idea. Uh, if you're just day trading or something like that, that means you're just scalping momentum. At that point, you would just just take calls or puts, right? Uh, of course, if you want to be less risky, you can still make it a spread. You'll still make money. Uh, but, but just generally speaking, the advantages of just calls or puts during a momentum play or day trade is uh, much more favorable for that instead of spreads. Um, and I saw somebody ask me why 695 and 665 for my strikes. Uh, a lot of that has to do with the size of my portfolio on uh, that challenge account. So it, it would have been more expensive for me to play 660. Also, I, I saw that there was um, potential that it could bounce before hitting 660. Uh, and, and that's just why I picked that. Um, but it, it's really just a matter of risk tolerance. Like, for example, usually when I have price targets set up on my screen... Say that, uh, I don't know, say I think Apple is going up to 150C or something. I'm not going to pick 150C for my spread, like this, my sell. I usually pick something a little bit closer, like a closer price target that I have, because I don't know for a fact if Tesla, or not Tesla, if Apple is going all the way up to 150. Like maybe there's there was previous resistance there, but maybe it doesn't go all the way. Um, and so this is just a, a matter of risk tolerance, right? So I usually pick something one strike in or a closer price target level that I feel comfortable with. Uh, and this is just for me to manage my risk. Um, and for people asking about, you know, I see a lot of talk about brokerages here. So all, all the brokerages are pretty good for like, they all have their pros and cons, right? So Robinhood, you know, obviously it's it's free, but there are some issues with it. You don't usually get very good fills on it. Uh, I, I do use Robinhood, but I also use other platforms as well. For example, I use Webull, and I also use um, Tastyworks. And Tastyworks is my favorite platform, actually, for options trading. Uh, but, you know, Tastyworks costs money. Not that expensive, actually. It's only... Um, you know, they only charge you to open the play. They don't charge you to close the play, things like that. But it, it's not really that expensive. But uh, I mostly just use different accounts to manage different types of portfolios or to manage different types of strategies in order for me to arrange my stuff. Um, but yeah, with Tastyworks, you might have to pay for it, but it actually pays back in value because I always get a better value from using Tastyworks on opening positions than when I use Robinhood. For Robinhood... I like I open a position and I wait there and it, like it doesn't fill for like 10 minutes or something. And then I end up going, okay, um, 
play is probably going to move soon, so I'm just going to have to increase my my uh, midpoint up, right? I'm going to have to go closer to the ask, or sometimes maybe even hit the ask on a on momentum play. Um, and so really, you're just with Robin Hood. You don't pay to make trades, but you pay back when you get filled because you don't get filled instantly. And Robin Hood is basically the bottom of the pecking order for um, uh, I forgot what it's called, but basically people who process the orders, right? Uh, and, and on top of that, we all know that Robinhood sells your data, your options, or not your options, well, just just the order flow data to uh, folks and institutions, right? So that's, I, I've known about that for a long time already, but, you know, there's no such thing as, there's no free lunch, right? Uh, there's always some kind of cost. So, um, but yeah, I, I still do use Robinhood because they're still great for certain things, but uh, I, I use it more for, like, more like sculpt type plays usually just because um with those kinds of quick in and outs the fees add up more quickly but at the same time uh i i use all the my brokerage is pretty equally it just depends on what my particular strategy is so robin hood i usually use for my challenge account purpose because i don't like to put too much money in robin hood uh and then tasty works i have a few accounts with Tastyworks actually, but basically I have a, an account depending on um, the strategy for that account. Like I have a long-term portfolio, then I have another account for just calendar spread, ER calendar spread plays. Uh, and this allows me to better manage my risk and also to see how a certain strategy is working out. Uh, sorry for all this extra information about brokerages here. I just felt like I would touch on that a bit. Is it worth saying low ball ask for the spread? Yes, uh, I see 007 and JTW both agree with that. And I definitely agree with that because sometimes you do get those crazy good fills and basically it increases the probability of success of the play significantly, right? Um, and, and it does happen. So I always put low ball bids in there. It's the same thing with crypto, actually. If anybody spending crypto and you've probably seen or heard of like you know ethereum flash crash or whatever um back in in like the older days of crypto trading and ever since that happened i always have a low ball bid of like you know a dollar or a cent or whatever on bitcoin and ethereum because i i was like man these guys got filled for cheap at like i forgot how low it got actually on on the ethereum flash crash uh, but it got really low and then it basically bounced right back up and it, the reason why it got that low is just because of low li liquidity and then um you know people stop losses hit right but then it instantly bounced back up and those people made you know thousands if, if not more than that right instantly so i always set lows low ball bids now because of that and it's the same thing with options because some options have you know pretty poor liquidity if someone fat fingers or something like that um or if someone is just hitting the ask suddenly because they want a game to play really bad then there's a chance that your uh, low ball bid will fill and so that's that's um, definitely always do that right set those limits when you buy uh, for max profit on spreads yes you do want the sold leg to I mean you hit max profit if both legs are in the money for for debit spreads um, so you either want it to be, you know, right on the dot or even further in the money. Uh, and if it's further in the money, it, you basically hit max profits, right? So the biggest hurdle for a beginner into spirits is the requirement for a margin account. Um, that, that is a point there. So that's why with... You know, but on Robinhood, which is what I think most a lot of uh, beginner traders use, it, it pretty much starts off as a margin account. Like, I don't think they even ask you. Like, most people don't even know what a cash account is until they realize um, that there's another service called the Weeple and it asks you if you want to do a cash account or a margin account. You can actually go cash on Robinhood as well, but you have to specifically ask them to disable margin. Uh, but yes. Uh, I, I assume most people have access to a margin account because it's pretty easy to 
apply for and get these days compared to before. Uh, before it used to be a lot harder to get these margin, margin accounts. Now you need a lot less to open one. And, and of course, um, you know, Robinhood automatically gives you one. Do you plan time to spend, or sorry, I read that backwards. Do you plan on to spend time on how and when we close slash stop spreads when it's not going the way we anticipate it? Say for example, simple calls, we can have 30% at stop loss. Do you have any guidelines for spreads? So good question. So when a, when a spread doesn't go your way, right? Um, and I'm going to answer this question real quick, and then I'm going to move on with the presentation because I actually do have some other things I want to talk about as well. Uh, so for for expiration, sorry, not expiration, for um, stop loss when a call doesn't go your way, usually I don't I don't really like to set percentages. I like to base it off of the chart. And you can set percentages, but usually the time I set percentages is when my call is already in the money or not in the money, but um, it's green on the plate, right? So uh, if, if any of you are on the crypto server as well, you're probably quite familiar with the fact that when your plate goes green, usually you like to set your stop loss above, like in the green, like basically once your play is green, especially if you're trading leverage, right? Because you're, 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 um, the value of your play, you know, can instantly go against you in a small move when you're leveraged, right? So we usually like to set that stop loss in the green. And so that's what I do with my plays as well. My personal rules for credit spreads, um, I mean, not credit spreads, debit spreads uh, is again, 90 to 95% if it's in the money, right? That's when I like to close. But if that's not the case, right? If it's just up, say, um, it goes up, say 50% or something, I would usually consider closing out, right? If it's especially if it's at a resistance, if it's a um, a bull spread or a call spread, right? So my rule for that though is, if the play is green, say it goes up fifty percent or more than fifty percent, say it goes up eighty percent, my rule is if it pulls back half of what it's gained, at that point that's where I I would stop out. So you can consider doing a trailing stop loss essentially, right? So for myself. Uh, this is, rule applies to just basic calls and puts as well, not just spreads. And it's usually where I apply this rule. If my play goes up 100%, always sell half, right? You, you're really familiar with that rule because Guru always talks about it. But my other rule is that, you know, if I hold runners, right, they're up 100%. If it goes, retraces back 50% of the value uh, from its peak, that's also when I sell out. So for example, if it goes up 200%, for example, and it goes all the way back down to 100%, I will stop out there, no matter what. It doesn't matter if I feel how I feel about the play. It's just how I manage that risk, right? Uh, and the only reason why I set that rule is because I've had times where I was like, it goes back 100%, down to 100% from being up more than 200%, for example. And I think like, oh, it's, you know, it's just dipping, it's going to go up again, whatever, you know, that, that kind of psychology, right? In my early days of trading, I was very susceptible to this. Now, you know, when something goes up a lot, you get euphoric. Um, and, and that's true for everybody, right? We, we learn to manage those emotions over time. And then it ended up going down from 100% up to down 50% up. And I'm like, oh, it's, it's back close to, you know, that first support where I, I first bought in or something. And then <laughs> it just keeps going down and it ends up being a red play when it was originally up, say, 200%, for example. And this happened a lot for me when I was starting out. And that's why I have this rule now where basically if it's over 100% for um, just calls or puts, anytime it retraces back 50% of the gains, I am going to have a trailing stop loss there and I will stop out. That's it. No more. Uh, you know, I'm out of the play. It doesn't matter if it goes up after that, but I am going to close the trade green. I am not going to risk it going red. And, and really... Any green trade is a good trade, right? We, we all know that. Like, even if you're only going up 1% a day, if you think about it, 1% a day for, I don't know, <laughs> 100 days is more than 100% because it's compounding. But anyways, uh, you basically, a green trade is good, and that's why we have those rules. For spreads specifically, though, uh, because you can't go over, um, 
a certain percentage, usually what I do is I will assess it on option strat, right? This is this is how I assess uh, plays. So you'll see your option strat. One of my favorite tools to use, right? So say that I'm getting a bear put spread right here. And say it's Tesla because that's what I've been talking about today. And say that I got March 19th Tesla put spread and say that we're getting 600 to, uh, I think I think this back, we're 600 to 580p. Okay. So the way I assess this here it is basically based on this table, right? You can change this here to percent of entry cost, and that's what you would use if you were wanted to assess that uh, ba based on a percentage. So for myself, the way I assess this is basically if, um, you know, I'm getting close to max profit, which is $1,050 on this play. Um, so if I hit 90, 95%, that's when I would close. So 950, I would close that here, right? So, th so uh, over time, your profit uh, profile changes, right? Because there is the factor of theta. Uh, also, other factors to think about would be IV, right? But we can't control that, so that's not something that we can assess uh, from a top-down level. We just have to assess that on a day-to-day -day basis. So usually I just, uh, once I see this and I hit this area, anything in this darker green area is like take profits on that day. So that's when I take profits. So if I hit this and it's 950 on the 11th, that's where I take profits, right? If it didn't hit that and it hit 972, I would take profits there. So this is my automatic take profit areas, right? Like I will automatically take profits whenever I see this happen, which is basically when you're getting close to max profits, right? For losses though, that's a little bit harder to manage for uh, for spreads in general, right? So I don't really set a percent loss for um, spreads. And I don't do that for calls or puts either. In general, I don't set rules for myself for stopping out based on the profit loss of the play. I always base it off of the chart. The only exception to this is if I am very close to expiration. If I am very close to expiration, I will consider closing out the play because there is not enough time for the play to recover, regardless of what I think on the chart, right? So if, if uh, I'm playing, for example, um, April 16th or something like that, then if it's two weeks out, say April 1st, this is starting when I would start considering, hey, maybe I need to roll out my play or close out this play at a loss um, if I don't have faith in the play anymore, right? Usually I go up to two to one weeks before the expiration, depending on what the charts say, right? So, for example, for Tesla here, uh, say that I'm in a bear spread, right? Or I put a put debit spread. This line right here is a major support zone area for me. Why? This is a 0 0.5 retrace from the run of uh, S&P 500 inclusion news, right? So this is before S&P 500 inclusion, and this is the peak of S&P 500 inclusion news. So this was the 50% of that play. And that's why um, I have this line here for this FIB. And also this is a pivot point, right? So we dip down here and then we bounce off of that. So I think that there's a, a good chance that this area is would act as support. And you see it lined up perfectly with this trend line here, right? So, um, if I was playing put spreads and I saw it bounce off of here, that's probably where I would close out my play, right? Because it already bounced off here, actually.
And then same thing with uh, for like on the bullish side. If you're hitting a resistance and you're rejecting off of it, that's where I'll take a play. And so in the case of a red play, so in other words, the play, when you first took the play, the play was already moving against you. Like it was never green, right? So for example, if I uh, played both side on Tesla and I see this bounce off of here and so I decided to enter calls on Tesla, right? Because it, it bounced strongly off of this uh, major support area with lots of confluence, right? So we got this horizontal support for a pivot. It's the 0 0.5 Fib and it's trend line from the consolidation zone. So it's a great area to go long, right? So say I went long here um, and say that instead it broke down. It didn't hold this area. So say that next week it goes down here, here again and I decided to go on calls because it bounced off of here previously and instead it breaks, right? So say it breaks down and now the play is red. So what I would always do is I would assess where the next support level is for me. And for me, that would be this zone right here, which is a 0 0.382 Fib and also the pivot top of the consolidation zone of Tesla before S&P 500 inclusion news. I think this area is probably a good support area. So that's what I would look for, right? So I would look for it to bounce off of the next major support, which is down here at 512. And so of course there's a quite a bit of, of downside to this. So basically I'll be buying at 540-ish and my downside will be like about $40 down to this area of about $500 right here. 510 to 500 is the zone. So there's, there's quite a bit of downside on those calls, but that's what I'll be looking for. Like if I entered here, I always look for where my next support level is, major support level on the trade. And if it doesn't hold that support, that's where I would bail out. Another way to do this, um, depending, again, this just completely depends on your risk tolerances. If you are trying to buy at support, and it doesn't hold that support, then that play is not valid, right? So that's in a completely red situation, in which case you would just set a tight stop loss on this play. So uh, just for example here, okay? So, so we see that we bounce pretty much perfectly off this area at about 540 or so uh five yeah 540 and say that we go down over here to this trend line 540 again then maybe i would only wait for one or two or candles below this and then i would stop out if i was trying to be very very conservative on the play at that point you can know probably you can set a stop loss maybe 10 percent down or something like that right because you're trying to capture this balance and if it's not bouncing off of it that means the play isn't valid uh, and but the thing is you know, for for this, it's probably not that good to use the next support because it's so far down, especially on, on this kind of analysis, my analysis. Um, but usually if there's a closer support, that's what I would use as reference point. Uh, but the thing is, Tesla moves so volatilely that if you're setting a stop loss like that, you can just, you're basically going to get um, stopped out and then it can still bounce, right? And I think JTW had a really, really good uh, video education on waiting for confirmations of trend breaks and stuff. So if you need uh, ideas on that and how to do that, uh, I would definitely refer to that video. It's in our Xtrades Discord server in the ed education section. I know that's probably uh, <laughs> not the risk management you wanted to hear, uh, but that is how I manage my plays is I always base it off of support and resistance level rather than just a strict percent of stop out or stop loss. The only time I use percent to manage my plays is for green plays because that's um, to prevent myself from basically eating losses when I was already in green. Uh, so losses I like to manage strictly based off of my own analysis instead of using percentages. Oh, uh, thanks to Bo7. I think he's gone already. The uh, Bo7 is going to be back on Monday to talk about ERs and charts. So if you need any of that, check that out.
uh, Monday through Friday, right? Um, on how to open a spread on Robinhood, I actually have a uh, PDF file with with pictures of how to how to do spreads. It's it's actually a guide on how to get around day trades using um, using different legs of options. Right, you're essentially opening a spread to get around day trading if you really need to close out a position. Uh, but in that, um, I have pictures and. Using that, you can basically know how to open a spread. But I'll consider uh, making a video for that um, probably later this month or something and upload that as well. So, uh, three day snoop. That PDF is actually in an education section already uh, uh, for um, B, B, e, B positive. I'm not sure if I'm reading your name right, sorry. Uh, but for um, back to the previous question on the data. Yes, the closer you get the data, I mean, sorry, I, I think the session has been a little bit long, but uh, the closer you get to expiration, um, the easier it is to hit max profit because uh, there is that less less volatility in in the spread play, right? Because you hit max profits at expiration if it, if the whole play is in the money, right? Before expiration, even though you are in the money, like deep in the money in the play. Um, Right, so you can see that it, you know it closely tr trends up over time, and same thing with here on on the negative side, right? Is because there's a possibility that your play can turn around, right? So that's that's where you have intrinsic and extrinsic value of your options contract, and where your two because you have two options contracts, where one of them has the potential to make more money than the other one. And so because of that, over time, you get more value out of your play uh, because that probability of it falling within that range that, for example, if it's already below 580, the probability that it, say, bounces back over 600 or over 580 decreases. So your, your um, profitability increases over time in terms of uh, how close you are to the strike. So that's why when you are really far away from the expiration, because there's a chance for the play to reverse, like go in the opposite direction of what you want, uh, you need to be more deep in the money in order to make the same profit as if it was just, say, one or two days out. I um, hope that explains that a little bit. Uh, essentially, that's what it's doing. But if you look at the Greeks, that is what is really happening. But basically, you're looking at the probability of the play reversing on you, essentially. So yeah, the, the leg that you're selling, the second leg is always going to be a support or resistance area that you've identified depending on which way you're playing, right? Or you can go a little bit closer, and that's what I usually do because uh, there's less risk that way. Because sometimes you see like um, their support, for example, over here, I identified support was over here, uh, 800 on Tesla. And you see that it never hit that support again, right? until a long time later, and it, it did hit that again, and then it broke. Uh, but basically, you know, I, I set that target to always be a little bit closer than where I identify a pivot area, just to uh, give myself a little bit more leeway on plays. All right. Um, I am just going to go over bar charts right now real quick for you guys. So this is the other... Uh, I typed in the wrong address. I did. Oh. Fartrade.com. There we go. So, so we've already been talking about this. 
On barchart.com, there's two ways you can uh, identify a debit play. One is when you go over here, you can use a bar chart screener, right? So they have something called a bowl called debit spread, and they have basically all the plays, they have screeners for them. And so we're looking at debit spreads right now. So I'm just going to look at bowl called debit spreads screener just to quickly go over how to use it. Uh, you've probably, if you've been to previous seminars, you've already seen this. Uh, so just bear with me here. Basically, uh, probability is the percent chance that a play will, will work out, like go green, right? Um, and this probability is just based on the Greeks, right? There's a complicated formula for options, um, and it's going to be based around the Greeks and other factors, right? But that's how this is calculated. So this is just a probability based strictly on statistics, essentially. Now, after we identify that kind of aspect of the play, you want to identify on the charts if the play is valid or not. Is there support or resistance there? Is it possible for Tesla to go up to, say, $900 in, in two weeks or something? Because if it doesn't happen and that's the play you're taking based off of this calculator, or not calculator, screener, then that's probably not something you want to play, right? So um, you can use this tool to help you identify those just based on statistics alone, but always fact check with your chart, identify your support and resistance to determine how to play it. Uh, here you can see the max profit, and that shows as a percent as well as a max loss. So you see that this play only costs 35 cents to play, but you can gain $5. And that's because the spread width is um, not spread width, the strike differential, right, is $5 because you have $10 strike and you have a $15 strike. So 15 minus 10 is 5. And then you have your leg one and your leg two, 50 cents and 15 cents costing 35 cents total. So your break even is 1035. So then uh, if you don't know the company, you can bring this up, pull it up and see what is going on here. And you're like, well, maybe it's basing out here. Maybe this might be a good risk reward play. I'm risking 35 cents to make $4.65. Maybe that's a good good deal. Um, so now that I've I've looked at that, I'm gonna go, okay. SOAC, let's pull it up on the chart and see what's going on, right? Uh, so I see that this, this is an acquisition, so this is like a SPAC, right? <laughs> so I see what's going on here. Um, basically, it's, it skyrocketed and it tanked, right? Uh, I think SPACs have been a little bit hit lately. Um, I personally don't really play SPACs myself. I know a lot of people have probably been playing like CCIV and stuff like that. But I don't play as many of those. So we see that a SPAC usually has good support around $10, right? So I think that's why this play is actually very reasonable if you think that it's going to be bullish. So it um, personally, I think the spread is too wide because it's never been up to $15. More likely, you're just... I think 10 is actually a good support, right? So, so the first leg of this play on this screener is probably not bad, uh, but 15 is... Is really far out and you're feels like a lotto at this point but you know there's a good chance it bounces around this area around 970 to ten dollars so maybe that's something um you know folks can consider but i'd probably make this strike a little bit closer here um but you know this is how you use this scanner you can use filters as well to change what you're looking at you can pick etf or stocks um etc Let's see, there's also a filter for like sector, I think, right, sector. So for example, if I am bearish on tech right now, because tech has been uh, not performing very well relative to the rest of the market, so they're underperforming, then maybe I want to play a different sector, like maybe I want to play, I don't know, consumer staples or something, because I think uh, those have a better chance of recovery then this is how I would use this to filter out for those things. Um, but yeah, this is one way to identify a possible place. On that, you can also use option strat to figure out those plays because it also tells you the chance of profit here and it gives you the variables. You can visualize it on a table or a graph to see you know, where you make profits, uh, how many days from expiration, right? So this is one way to identify it by using screeners and tools like this. And of course, the, the, the way I usually do it, of course, is, you know, you have a trade 
that you already want to play and you identify that setup there, right? Uh, but if you need ideas, this is a great way to find them because, um, you know, it gives you the actual statistics of it happening, right? So this could be a good way to screen for, for new tickers that you might never have noticed uh, were really popular or are popping up right now um, and have a high probability based on statistics. But you just always want to make sure you're, you're double checking on the chart to see if it's actually a reasonable play or not, or if you can tweak that play a little bit to make it a better play, right? So this is just a, a good way to get those ideas. Um, but yep, I, I think I'm going to close the session today here in regards to the actual seminar. If you guys have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them now. Or if you guys want me to do some quick charting, I could do a few, um, probably for like another 10 minutes or so, and then I have to get going too. But yeah, hope you guys found this seminar helpful. Uh, I want to thank you know, JTW and 007 for answering a lot of questions as well as uh, Young Bull and Red Black for helping moderating the chat. Um, but yep, thanks, thanks again for joining us this weekend. Uh, and if you know, if you need some guidance or you want to talk more with people, trade ideas, uh, find good plays, come and join us on X Trades if you are not already a part of it. Uh, and next video next seminar not sure when that's going to be um probably in about two weeks but i think i'm busy the next couple weekends so it might be actually the end of the month but i'll i'll update you guys in the discord and make an announcement when we have that next uh next seminar video but these videos are going to be up for two weeks and i will try to get them up on youtube but yep thanks again everyone for coming to join us now, any questions? Gonna go over the chat here. <laughs> yeah, uh, moneyness is how close uh, basically the the play is to uh, being in the money. That's that's all it really means. So um, it's measuring a difference between the current price and like the legs. And yes, uh, as JTW mentioned, you can open up spreads separately if you want to. And I, I do that a lot, actually, because whenever I'm trying to capture a momentum play on a stock, I will take the, the leg first. And then once I notice momentum is starting to die or something, then I might convert it to a spread so I can swing it because I'm still uh, biased in that direction. But I feel like maybe it might bounce or something. So basically it's a way for me to lower my risk and allow me to swing safely and still collect profits if the play continues to move in that direction. So I do open up spreads a lot of times as uh, separate legs, um, but it just depends on you know the stock. If it's, if it's a big fast mover right now, then I'm probably gonna be opening it separately. All right. Uh, anybody have any chart requests or other questions they want to talk about? If not, I will bounce out of here. Um, I will be uploading a my weekend report tomorrow. Uh, so if you want some tickers analyzed or have some ideas, uh, be sure to vote on that uh, week weekend report ticker form. Uh, so I can take a look at those if, for you guys if you want anything analyzed. Uh, and I'll include in that report, you know, my usual market analysis, what's going on and what I think about what's going to happen with it. Uh, currently, you know, I think the markets are wanting to bounce, right? We have this stimulus news over the weekend, uh, but I'm not convinced yet that we are going to bounce straight up from here. Uh, I feel like it could just be a temporary bounce and that there might be more downside. But 
you know, that's just my opinion right now. Um, but I'll explain a little bit more about other indicators and things I'm looking at, such as Dex and Gex in that report. All right. Well, I hope you guys all have a wonderful weekend and good luck trading next week. Um, you know, this is a fun time to trade, actually, because there's a lot of volatility on the markets and there are still opportunities out there. Uh, but, you know, it's it's good to play safe. So stick with UC spreads to your advantage. Uh, I, I feel like, you know, the markets are really volatile. Spreads help to minimize that risk potentially. Uh, but of course, in this volatile situation, there's also a lot of opportunities for quick momentum scalps, right? And in those, you can just do regular calls and puts. Uh, but yeah, stay safe out there. And until next week. Signing out.